So a thing that comes up on this channel a lot is the idea of the Goldilocks zone around a star. The area around a star where a planet is orbiting where it's not too hot and not too cold for water to exist on the surface of that planet and therefore life as we know it to be able to exist and thrive. And obviously Earth is in the Sun's habitable zone or Goldilocks zone. And when we search for other exoplanets around other stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, we're also searching for whether they're in the Goldilocks zone around that star. But then there's another thing you can think about. You can then say, is the star going around the center of the galaxy in the galactic Goldilocks zone, or the galactic habitable zone? The place where, you know, you're not going to have too much radiation from either intergalactic space or from the supermassive black hole that we think is in the center of every galaxy. Now that's as far as I'd ever thought about it, this idea of habitable zones and Goldilocks zones. But one of my YouTube subscribers in one of the comments on some video where I must have mentioned habitable or Goldilocks zones of some form, they said, okay, you can have a stellar habitable zone and then the next step is galactic habitable zone. But is there a universal habitable zone? Is there somewhere in the universe where you're more likely to find a planet that can host life than other places in the universe? And I was like, that is an excellent question. So off I scurried to search the astronomical literature for some clues about whether anybody had ever considered this question of a universal habitable zone. To do that though, we need to kind of understand what we mean when we define a habitable zone. So a stellar habitable zone is very well defined. It's based on temperature and it's whether you're in the regime between zero degrees centigrade and 100 degrees centigrade. You know, the region of temperature within which water can exist in liquid form. And we can do that really well because we know the temperature of stars from the light that they're giving off, something we call a black body spectrum. It allows us very easily to measure the energy from the star and get out the temperature. And we know how that energy falls off with distance as well. And so what we can define is something called the effective temperature of a planet of a given distance around a star. And obviously that will change given whether it has an atmosphere and what constitutes that atmosphere as well. And so we can say there's a sort of a loosely bound habitable zone around this star. And we can also say, well, if it had an Earth atmosphere, then this is the more probably narrow region of habitability around that star. But it's very, very well defined. And it means that we can statistically probe that as well, looking at huge populations of stars and planets. And that idea was first introduced by Huang in 1959, you know, way before the first exoplanet was ever discovered in 1995. But this idea of galactic habitability wasn't introduced until 2001 by Gonzalez, Brownlee and Ward. And they introduced this idea that a planet's star's position orbiting around the Milky Way could either aid or hinder the development of life or completely destroy life entirely. So aiding would be the fact that you could be in a very metal-rich area of the galaxy. And now when I say metals, I'm talking about anything heavier than hydrogen. That's what astronomers call metals. There's hydrogen and then there's just metals. It's everything else. But essentially it's the, the building blocks that you would need for life. It's carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, all the way up to iron, those kind of things that you would need to form complex organisms. Hindering life could involve uh, a star having a really close flyby with another star if you're in a very dense area of the Milky Way. Those kind of interactions can actually really disrupt the orbits of planets and planetesimals, asteroids around stars. And so you could start flinging things out. The planet itself, yes, you could fling out of the star's habitable zone, but also you could disrupt an asteroid out in the asteroid belt, for example, around the sun or in the Oort cloud that could then actually put it on a, an impact trajectory with the planet 
that's hosted life. You know, there is some ideas that perhaps this is where the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs came from. Perhaps the sun had some form of interaction with another body in the Milky Way and that's kicked something out of its orbit around the sun and it's impacted with the Earth. And yeah, that impact did kill off the dinosaurs, which were, you know, huge, big creatures, but a lot of small creatures survived as well as plant life and then most marine life as well. In terms of destroying all life, then they say that perhaps that could actually be from a proximity to a lethal supernova. So supernova give off a lot of radiation. This is when a star runs out of fuel, runs out of hydrogen gas to burn, and so it throws off all its outer layers in this huge energetic outburst that I guess people would like to call an explosion. And in that supernova, a lot of x-rays and other high energy radiation can be produced and if that impacts with the planet hosting life then that's going to be an issue. Now herein lies the problem. How do you quantify supernova lethality? How do you quantify how deadly a supernova would be? How do you quantify how distant from a supernova you would need to be in order to be safe from some sort of x-ray dosage? You know, what kind of dosage would be able to destroy all life on Earth? Those are questions that we're not entirely sure how to answer. Also, how do you quantify how an interaction between two stars could disturb orbits of planetesimals and planets going around that star? That's, again, something that's very difficult to quantify. The metal content of a galaxy, though, that's actually something we're quite good at measuring. That's something that astronomers have been doing for a long time, not just in the Milky Way, but in lots of other galaxies as well. However, there are also things called gamma ray bursts, which happen in the most energetic supernova, the kind of things that are going to form neutron stars and black holes. And gamma ray bursts are very, very dangerous because unlike in a supernova where the radiation is given out, you know, 360 degrees around in all different directions, a gamma ray burst is very collimated. And so it's very, very direct. And so if you're in the direct line of fire of that gamma ray burst, you're going to get a huge dose of gamma ray radiation very quickly. Gamma ray radiation being the kind of thing that people associate with radioactivity. And we know radioactivity is very bad for life. The thing is though, they're much rarer events than supernova. Like the number of gamma ray bursts that we've detected compared to the number of supernova we've ever observed is a tiny, tiny fraction. So much that we've never even detected a gamma ray burst in the Milky Way itself. The thing is there are also other objects that give off gamma ray bursts and those are quasars or growing supermassive black holes. So black holes that are currently, you know, sucking in material, accreting material at such a rate that the pressure is so great around them that it actually can't accrete all that material at once. And so what it does instead is throw off that material either in jets, which are again very, very collimated, like a gamma ray burst kind of radiation, or in outflows as well that can impact the surrounding medium in the galaxy. And so you also, as well as not wanting to be near a gamma ray burst, you don't want to be anywhere near a supermassive black hole that's growing either. Equally though, you don't want to be on the outskirts either, because on the outskirts it's a lot less dense, there's a lot less stars. And if there's a lot less stars, then there's a lot less stars to produce all of those elements you need for life, like oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon, and disperse them through space. And so for those reasons, the galactic habitable zone is much more difficult to define than the habitable zone around a star, because you can't statistically quantify all of those things. Now that doesn't stop people from trying though, because what you can do is make a load of assumptions. You can simplify the problem back down to its basics in order to be able to understand it. And then the understanding you glean from those simplifying assumptions, you can then use to take it one step further. And at each stage you can learn more and more. I mean, most foundations of physics are based on these simplifying assumptions. You know, there's the really famous joke, which I'm pretty sure Sheldon tells in the Big Bang Theory actually, that, you know, a farmer has an issue with looking after his cows. You know, he can't figure out how to optimize, you know, getting them out of the field and back into the barn at the end of the night. So the physicist this goes away, comes back a week later and says, I have a solution for you, but it only works for spherical cows in a vacuum. 
because he simplified the problem so much that he's assumed a cow is spherical and he's assumed that they're moving around in a vacuum because then you don't have to worry about drag and air resistance and all those kind of things. Obviously, that isn't an extreme to the situation, but this is how we figure out problems. When people are saying, you know, you're trying to answer a question about the universe, where do you start? Well, you start by simplifying it as much as you possibly can. And that might seem like physicists are sort of saying, oh, it's too complex, we'll never understand it. No, this is an incredibly complex thing. And so simplifying it is necessary in order to, for us to gain the understanding that we need. And yeah, we will keep adding those layers and layers of complexity, but we'll get there eventually. You can't just jump straight in. And this is why, you know, scientific ideas and hypotheses take so long to go from that first inception and mature and become these well-rounded theories that can then be accepted into what we know as, you know, the laws of physics. So all of these things play into this idea of a universal Goldilocks zone, which is where this video is going. But I really did get distracted for the last couple of minutes, didn't I? Anyway, and people who study this are called cosmobiologists. Cosmo, cosmology is in, you know, the formation and evolution of the universe and biology because, well, life. But life uh, finds a way. So we can build a cosmobiological model of the universe to see where do you get the greatest number of habitable planets forming in the universe. And so there was a group of authors that did just this in 2015. It was Dale and collaborators. And their model again was based on the metal content of the gas that a star forms from, the total number of stars in the vicinity, and also the probability of avoiding a supernova. So that comes not just from the number of stars, but also the distribution of the masses of stars, like where the biggest mass stars will form. And what they found, weirdly to me anyway, was that actually you don't want to be in a small galaxy where there would be less stars, because if there is a big supernova in that galaxy, then those effects are going to be felt in planets around all the stars in that galaxy because it's so small. Whereas if you have a large galaxy and you have a supernova on one side, then the planets around stars on this side are still going to be fine and not even notice the effects of that supernova. But the thing is, the large galaxies have more stars in them. So you're in danger of the idea of stellar crowding, where you're going to have more and more interactions. So there is a definite sweet spot in there that they tried to find by looking at how the number of planets formed in certain galaxies changed as they changed all of these variables. And what they found for this sweet spot was that it was the most massive galaxies, but with the lowest star formation rate as well. So not forming any new stars, which means that all of the massive stars that are going to go supernova and be maybe quite lethal to life have already died off. And in doing so, have then enriched the surrounding space with all of these fresh metals, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, iron, everything that you would need to form a planet that's hospitable to life. And they did all this in relation to the Milky Way. And so they found that in a galaxy like that, you would have 10,000 times more habitable planets in that kind of galaxy than you would in the Milky Way. But I see a problem here because the most massive galaxies that have very low star formation are usually found in clusters of galaxies. You know, you don't form the most massive galaxy without merging it with a lot of smaller and smaller galaxies. And so those type of things tend to happen in these huge big clusters of upwards of a thousand galaxies. And in these mergers of galaxies, yes, you grow the mass and yes, you use up all the gas for star formation very, very quickly so that star formation dies off. But you also feed the supermassive black hole. And as you feed the supermassive black hole, you increase the amount of radiation in the vicinity. So much so that those jets from the supermassive black hole can actually fill all the surrounding intergalactic space in that cluster and have an effect not just on the galaxy in the center, but all of the galaxies around it as well. So here's where I'm gonna add my two cents to this idea of a universal habitable zone. Building on the result from Dayal and Collaborators in 2015, saying that you need the most massive galaxies with the lowest amount of star formation rate. If you need to stay out of the massive clusters of galaxies that we see that have got a lot of this quasar activity going on that's gonna be bad for life, then I think what you need is what we call a fossil group of galaxies. A fossil group is where you used to have a group or a cluster of galaxies orbiting around the central galaxy that was the most massive one in the group. 
And so they've all been pulled in by gravity to merge with that central thing. Merging, using up a lot of the gas that you could use to make more stars and ending up with a very massive thing left over pretty much isolated in the rest of space that's no longer forming stars because it's used up its gas in all those mergers. It's grown very, very massive. So if supernova do go off, they're not likely to affect planets around stars on the other side of that massive galaxy. And there's nothing bringing in any gas from externally outside of the galaxy anymore either. So you're probably not gonna feed your supermassive black hole in the center either. So if you can find a galaxy that is clearly a remnant of a fossil group, a massive thing, isolated in the vastness of space with very low star formation rate and very low rate of growth of the black hole, then I think you found the ideal place in the universe for a habitable planet, the perfect Goldilocks zone. Ugh, listen to me. I might as well just be singing my sticky, sticky shoes. My sticky, sticky shoes. Take so long to... <coughs> <coughs> Here we go. So you've got the total mass. Oh, Christ. Oh. Oh. Uh. Orbiting around the Milky Way could actually affect either. Mm, buzzing, does that come across on the sound? I don't know. I'm going to put it in there. Somebody's followed me on Twitter. Hello, Jeff Matt 4016 And this is why, you know, scientific idea ideas? <laughs> okay. I know, I know, I still haven't put stuff up on the walls. I'm so sorry. I know a lot of you went to a lot of effort as well, like finding art and suggesting what I should get. And I will get round to it, I promise. This room is just not priority at the minute. There are other rooms in the house that, oh my universe, they really, really, really needed some TLC. So we did those first. I'll get around to this eventually. I promise.